My name is Rick Arthur. I'm uh, I'm doing a currently doing a prescribed burn plan and a vegetation management plan for the the Tongue Creek Ranch. I have an extensive background in wildfire, prescribed fire, uh, fire behavior, fire history, and fire regime analysis. So I've applied a lot of those tools in in the in the work that we're doing on Tongue, on the Tongue Creek Ranch and. Uh, I thought we'd first start uh, largely talking about the vegetation management plan, and then we'll go into the prescribed burn planning. So first of all, the, the Tongue Creek Ranch is located just uh, southwest of, of Black Diamond, uh, west of Highway 22 near Hartnell. And it's composed of, uh, of tidal lands, uh, for private lands, also some uh, Nature Conservatory of Canada lands and uh, some grazing leases. Uh, the reason the Tongue Creek Ranch is focusing on a vegetation management plan is we're trying to come up with a, a plan to proactively address woody plant expansion, also known as, as brush ingress or willow ingress or a variety of different things that it's known as, but, but you can see the issue here yeah, in the foreground, uh, there's there's uh, light brush coming up through the grasslands uh, on the slopes. You can see where conifer as well as willow and aspen have started to dominate over the grasslands. And what woody plant encroachment is, is, is just an increase of biomass of the woody plants and grassland ecosystems. And it is a global threat around the world. Uh, and it's impacting grass, grassland biomes, and as well as the people and the plants and the animals who depend on them. And the grasslands of southern Alberta are no different, and they're significantly being impacted by woody plant encroachment and are in significant decline. I think we have to understand that in our forest and, and grassland ecosystems, uh, both forest cover and grasslands have lived uh, side by side or, or were there side by side for the longest period of time. But Indigenous people were constantly burning to maintain these, these sub -eco regions. So we've got the, uh, the Foothills Parkland sub -eco region, which is largely grassland and, and, but, but still has some forest cover. And then we also have a montane sub -eco region which is more forest cover, but still had historically lots and lots of grassland. And it's largely due in both cases for the indigenous people using fire to maintain and renew these ecosystems, to keep the forest cover back into the younger seral stages and to maintain healthy uh, grasslands. Uh, fire wasn't the only uh, renewal mechanism for grasslands and for these younger seral stages. But it was uh, it was uh, applied uh, extensively and, and constantly by by indigenous peoples, and the other would be uh, bison herbivory or or grazing, and these large masses of herds of, of bison that came across the prairies helped to maintain and keep the the the, the brush and and uh, woody plant encroachment down. There are five stages to woody plant encroachment, and and if we don't apply any kind of disturbance, these grasslands will become impacted and eventually transition to permanent forest cover. And once they are permanent forest cover, it's very difficult to turn them back into grassland. So I've been using three broader scales, the core, ingress, and then forested, where areas have actually trans transitioned to forested. That's not to say that in both sub eco regions, there wasn't lots and lots of grass, which there was, but there was also some areas that were permanently forested and it's important to recognize that. Uh, very importantly in this statement here, we need to recognize landscapes that we see, see today are not what existed historically and they may not be sustainable for the future. And, and a second point that, that we seem to regularly forget is that many species adapted to the frequent use of fire by indigenous peoples over thousands of years. Those same species are now being impacted by fire exclusion where we're not putting fire back on the landscape to renew these, these ecosystems. 
when they were burning was generally in early spring or late fall when the grasses were cured. Um, and uh, there was still a lot of soil moisture, particularly in the spring. So it was a, it might have been high intensity fire, but had low severity impacts. It wasn't impacting soils and watersheds, as an example, which high intensity, high severity wildfire does at the peak of summer. Fire danger indices were much lower when they were burning. Here's some examples of, of change over time. Uh, this is a photo from the, the Mountain Legacy Project. A.O. Wheeler uh, was one of our early surveyors in 1897. He was up on, <coughs> sorry, he was up on uh, uh, a station called uh, Highwood Gap, which is uh, just west of Eden Valley and right near the, the forest reserve boundary. And looking westwards, you can see uh, large fire events in the upper foothills. Right? And uh, I should note that, that each of our different sub regions had a different fire return interval. So the higher elevations, uh, upper foothills, uh, didn't burn as frequently, uh, just cooler and damper, so you have longer fire return intervals. But in the montane areas, like in the foreground here, uh, Lots and lots of fire, and you can see that that those those slopes on the lower right hand of the image, uh, in this picture, they're just starting to fill in with a little bit of deciduous, uh, and uh, a little bit of mixed wood, some young conifer coming up on the slopes in the in the in the mid foreground. Uh, all those areas were were subject to frequent fire. Uh, you can also see areas where you have an older partial burn and areas that did not burn because of their aspect, the refugia. Uh, that's more of a north to northeast aspect, so it's sheltered and cooler. Uh, and generally would not burn in early spring when indigenous people were burning. So, so they grew up into to, uh, conifer forest. Uh, just a note on the bottom of the exposed river bars. Uh, due to a, a flood event, probably the 1880s and maybe even early 1890s. Uh, another surveyor titled in 1942 is the same location. And, and you can see some changes on these slopes. We've had, we've had two major fire events, 1910 and 1936, burn most of the Highwood uh, watershed and, and uh, those that didn't burn, you can see are starting to fill in. So some of those slopes that were uh, starting to show evidence of young conifer are now starting to show us uh, advanced growth. Some of the refuge areas are now much smaller, but they still, some of them survived even in those severe indices in 1910 and in 1936. But <laughs> again, the, the uh, the forest cover is filling in a lot of areas now, and you can see that on the on the bottom right, those areas that were relatively open previously are now uh, mixed wood for the most part, or even pure conifer. Uh, 19 or 2014, uh, post 2013 flood, you can see those those uh, gravel bars along the river are open wide up again. Uh, there are some grassy slopes, but those are south-facing slopes, very, very dry xeric slopes. And now the, the, the slopes and even the foreground is now filling in with the, the upper slopes, mature conifer, and the bottom, lower slopes are now all mature mixed wood and in some cases mostly conifer, spruce dominating. Uh, this is a location near Pekesco Creek. Uh, Bear Hills West, Wheeler again, 1898, and uh, it transitions to heavy forest cover uh, without disturbance. I'm just gonna go back here. One of the things that I look for is, is on these, these images to give me some indication of, of indigenous burning or frequent fires is simply the, the lack of black sticks or or burnt sticks from, from trees that have grown up over the years and then burned, uh, leaving charred, charred sticks remaining or a charred forest remaining. If it's frequent fire, uh, you don't see that because the, the forest cover doesn't get a chance to grow up. 
in this case here, uh, the bright green in a pine in the foreground is, and in some of the background, you can see uh, part of the 1910 uh, fire event that either, either burnt that or caused it to seed in. In this case, in the foreground, especially seeding in. Down in the, the castle area, uh, Carbondale Lookout is this location. And we're looking across uh, the valley. You can see much of those landscapes very open. Uh, it is a montane forest ecosystem. And, and again, frequent fire throughout there, keeping it open. And then today it's, it's growing in heavily with conifer. In fact, some of the areas that, that had conifer have now been harvested. Bridgeland, Ernest Creek, and this is just south of the um, Old Man River looking northwards. And, and again, tremendous amount of fill in with, with conifer harvesting or conifer growth. So what is a vegetation management plan? Uh, it's an assessment of the range condition, woody plant encroachment and forest cover across the ranch. And hopefully it's gonna aid in setting priorities and options for, for treating this, this uh, woody plant encroachment to maintain the health and vigor of, of intact grasslands and restore areas that have been impacted. Uh, should help us to create some long-term plans and decision-making historically, I think uh, along the foothills in Alberta, we'll see where areas where, where people have taken some very vigorous steps to try to control uh, woody plant encroachment in the past. Uh, and then they've gone on to other things and some of these areas have gone back. So what we wanna do is protect those, the core areas, those, those, those healthy grassland areas and keep them healthy. We want to try to renew uh, areas in which uh, woody plant encroachment is just starting so that we can return that to a healthy grassland state and then target source areas of, of woody plant encroachment, the, the seeding areas. And it's a matter of selecting the right tool for the right job. And also uh, that we're gonna to have to take, take multiple approaches to, to truly restore some of these areas. There's no silver bullets out there. You can't just do something once and say we're done. Uh, we can also set annual targets uh, and projects by management units. In this case here, we're going to use the, the, uh, the same pasture slash fields that, that have been identified as management units on the ranch. We've developed two different da databases. One is the existing vegetation cover, which defines and segregates relatively healthy grassland. Uh, and areas that eventually evolve to uh, through various stages of brush encroachment to forest cover, that transition, but we're also identifying areas that were likely historically a forest cover. And the historic vegetation cover is, is, is probably some groundbreaking research where we're looking at reconstruction of what the historical vegetation, co vegetation cover was over the area. And I'm targeting about an 1860 to 1880 estimate. Uh, indigenous burning was still occurring. There would have still been some uh, bison grazing, although it's tapering off. And uh, European impacts are, are relatively low at that point. Uh, my belief is this, that a lot of, with a range of variation, a lot of these areas were maintained probably for thousands of years through the use of frequent fire as grasslands. To, to create this historic vegetation cover, well, we'll talk about, here's the results we got, again, looking at, at just numbers here. Um, core is grass and haylands. We're not really dealing with the hay or cultivated lands in this, this plan. Uh, but the ingress uh, B1, B2 is just uh, light to moderate brush and then moderate to heavy brush. Ingrowth conifer, ingrowth deciduous, ingrowth willow, uh, a mix of willow or conifer or deciduous, and then, and then areas we identified as, as forested. These aren't necessarily um, permanent forested lands at this point. And this is the mapping results that we have from that, that 
our existing vegetation cover. Uh, lots of, of willow encroachment, but we also see lots of uh, a mix of, of immature uh, deciduous coniferous as well as, as mature forest cover really establishing well across some areas in the ledge. To recreate a, a or reconstruct a historic vegetation cover, uh, cover I, I made four assumptions. Uh, I could probably add one more in there, but uh, number one is that there's frequent use of fire by indigenous peoples and it's extensive and it's across the region. It was not well acknowledged historically by anthropologists, but we're starting to recognize that fire was really used by, by native people a lot. And they were very good at it. And they really understood uh, what we in Western science now refer to as first order and second order fire effects. First order fire effects, basically the immediate impacts of a fire. Uh, did it kill the, the forest cover as an example? Long-term impacts or second uh, second order fire effects or how certain plants will respond to fire, or perhaps the fire was so severe that it's impacted the watershed and soils for, for long periods of time. Um, with the frequent fire return interval and bison grazing, grasslands dominated the, the foothills and parklands foothills, parklands, and montane forest sub-equal regions. Uh, certainly the montane would have had more forest cover, slightly held elevation, uh, but both sub-equal regions had consider, were considerably younger in, in forest growth or vegetation growth than they are today. Northerly aspects are cooler, damper, they dry slower than other aspects, so they hold snow in the spring. They did not burn uh, as frequently uh, when indigenous people were burning in early spring because they were still cooler and damper. So you see more forest uh, cover established on those slopes, but when you look at, at some of the historic mapping, um, they were definitely much younger than they were today. So to validate those assumptions, I, I used a number of different res resources to help reconstruct this historic vegetation cover. One was, uh, numerous journals from early traders and explorers. Uh, Peter Fiddler, as an example, uh, in his journals, none of them are, are specific to any area, but uh, as far as vegetation cover, but he, he makes reference in his, his travels from present day Elk Point down to Livingston Gap. And he left in, in November of 1792, returning in March of 1793, so a five-month period during the winter. In his journals, he references major fire events 33 times. Um, comments like, we've traveled for three days and there's no grazing for horses because the, the ground is burnt. Major fires to the southeast, uh, natives are burning. Uh, ground still smoldering. These are just examples of, of what he was seeing. So from that, you can, you can imagine and you can visualize that, that burning by Indigenous people was a constant and frequent thing. Uh, the Mountain Legacy Project is, is uh, a project station based out of the Univ University of Victoria, and they're focused on, on identifying collections of digital images that were taken by our early surveyors when they were creating our first topographic maps in the Rockies and other mountain regions in Western Canada. So they would take box cameras along with their, all their survey equipment. They would take thousands of shots with their survey equipment. Then they took these glass plate photographs and with a focal plane technique, used that imagery to help fill in the blanks that they had for, for making the topographic maps. Uh, the beauty of those images is that they were taken right across the landscape at, at the same period. So it gives us a snap, snapshot in time of what those ecosystems looked like. Extremely valuable. And especially when you, you go out and repeat the images and then do a comparative analysis. First aerial photography was in the late 40s, early 50s, but in 1958, uh, there's a really nice scale of photography, 15840, that was used for the phase two forest inventory. And uh, it's, it's very clear, covers about two thirds of the ranch area. 
uh, phase two forest inventory uh, was Alberta's first detailed forest inventory. It doesn't cover the ranch area, it just stops the forest reserve boundary, but you can interpret what they were seeing and as far as, as the vegetation uh, just west of the ranch and what's on the ranch. We have detailed fire regime analysis from adjacent forests and reserves uh, in the montane sub region. And, and uh, that's extremely valuable to help us understand, again, how frequent fire was. The current age classes of existing forest cover within the ranch indicate when the forest cover established itself. And when you look at, at some of the historical imagery, you can see that there was no forest there previously. So uh, we know that a lot of this is now forest or brush encroachment. Topography is a very important tool as well. Uh, again, as I said earlier, uh, forests will tend to establish themselves on those uh, northerly aspects. Uh, the length of grade is important, the steepness of slope, slope as well. Uh, sometimes when you have a short uh, pitch that might be northerly, it doesn't necessarily mean that it was, it was grassed over. Uh, largely it was, uh, or I should say forest covered over, it was largely grasslands because there wasn't enough of a slope to provide the shading or, or, or snow encroachment to keep maintain that and not let it burn. Here's some examples of, of the uh, various studies of, of mean, looking at mean fire return interval. These are from fire regime analysis done by Cliff White and uh, Marie-Pierre Rajot. And looking at these regions, you can see there's a significant amount of burning going on. And in the Highwood area, in, the, in looking at a 27 uh, year rotation age or return interval, Porcupine Hills again close 16 to 22 years. Uh, we know that the montane uh, regions of the, of the ranch would have been in those lower return intervals, fire return intervals. Other resources that could be used uh, to improve uh, historic vegetation mapping, it would include uh, looking at soil mapping, anal analysis of existing soil reports, hydrological assessments, uh, detailed review of range assessments, looking at, at a comparison of condition class and vegetation change over time, as well as the original survey maps that have notes and references to terrain, springs, and elevation. Uh, as a result, here's the numbers that, that I came up with. I'll give you more of a change here, but that's just a, an indication of how, how much we see the grasslands uh, being much larger historically than they were today. And this is the, uh, the map that we created. And again, shows a lot of change in, in much more grassland. There may have been a little bit more shrub growth or willow growth in especially long drainages, but they were also subject to frequent burning. Uh, there's the historic vegetation change or the existing versus the historic. And so this is what we're dealing with today and, and large amounts of encroachment. Looking at encroachment over time uh, for the grasslands on tidal lands today, Healthy grasslands compose roughly 25% uh, of the, the surface area. Historically, as much as 90% would have been grasslands. So a healthy range loss of 65%. And it varies as you get further into the, the, the montane areas, and, uh, but still a significant changes, uh, amount of change that has occurred over, over each of those regions or, or land ownerships. And just a, a little more detailed assessment, looking at, at uh, current vegetation, the very areas in, in light yellow, we've assessed as being healthy core grasslands. The areas in gray are, are hay or cultivated. And then there's a variety of, of various ingresses going on. And here's, uh, here's what it looks like historically. So there's a lot of area that, that could be treated and should be treated to return it back to, to healthy grasslands. Again, if we don't start maintaining and looking after woody plant encroachment, 
uh, we will be losing our grasslands and and a lot of these uh, these lands that we're currently using for historic uh, ranching and grazing will no longer be viable in the future. So it's something we have to treat. So why prescribe fire for for restoring rangelands? And I, I'm going to start by saying that that prescribed fire isn't the only tool that that we could be using. There's lots of other tools. Grazing uh, and good grazing practices certainly help to to reduce woody plant encroachment. Uh, brushing and and uh, harvesting and and a variety of things. But historically, fire was used to to create and maintain these these ranch lands that we've considered since Europeans arrived. In many cases, our early Europeans thought they were very natural and this was a natural landscape. But the reality is is that indigenous people were using fire to maintain them for thousands of years. Fire as a tool. Uh, Early hominids started using fire an estimated 1.8 million years ago. Um, they found evidence in, in caves in the Swarkings in South Africa and in Mongolia of, of trace amounts of fire that date it right back to 1.8 million years ago. And those early hominids would have used it for warmth and protection. Um, they cooked their food, so at the time, larger mandibles, smaller uh, brain cavities by, by getting a steady diet of protein, uh, which fire helped them to do, that helped to increase brain cavity size, cooking the food reduced uh, mandible size, and through evolution, we are where we are today. Uh, but fire became uh, very central in, in, in human development, as well as organizations of communities. And without fire, it's doubtful that we would have humanity as it today, as we do today, certainly not the organizational communities or even languages. Uh, humans became known as keepers of the flame and humans, wherever humans went, fire came with them. And without fire, our species simply would not have evolved as we have. Indigenous people in North America have used fire uh, as a tool to shape and maintain landscapes and the habitat uh, of the species that they depend on. And as I said earlier, many species adapted to the, to the human use of fire. Many of those same species are threatened, endangered, at risk, or even extinct. And I believe a large part of it may be because of their dependence on fire and fire exclusion. It's something we have to, to start thinking about. With prescribed fire, uh, everyone is concerned about fire. And, and, and we know that fire is a is a is a wonderful servant, but it's a terrible master, and we're afraid of fire for for fear of it escaping. Wildfires, uh, those pushed by the winds, uh, such as the the grass fires we had last fall, extremely dangerous to to any of our communities and and to our, our ranches and developments. So, with prescribed fire, uh, safety is the first and foremost concern. Lighting a fire is easy, holding on to it's the trick, and we want to make sure we hold on to it really well. Prescribed fire is low severity fire. So again, low severity fire, the impacts long term. If you have drought conditions and you're burning those drought conditions, chances are some of the fire you're using is going to burn some of the organics out of the soil. Uh, in low severity fire, where we still have moisture content, um, lots of moisture generally, it doesn't impact the soil or root structures of the plants. Uh, the prescription that we write is specific to the fuels, the ter terrain, and the objectives that we want to treat, as well as the climatic conditions. Uh, and, and those weather and fuel conditions must fall within the, the, the scope of the prescription. If it's outside of the, of the prescription, then we shouldn't and will not be burning. Another very important point is that adequate resources must be on site to be able to contain and control the fire. Oops, okay, there we go. Uh, our prescription, uh, Generally, in this case here, is 100% cured grass and it assumes three tons per hectare, but uh, really a lot of the burning that we're doing is going to be less than one ton per hectare because of the, the grazing that has occurred. The, the terrain that we're working on is flat to gently rolling. 
And very specifically, we're going to stay within a, a range of uh, 20 degrees, minimum RH of 15% and a maximum wind speed of 15 kilometers an hour. And the fire intensities that we are, are, are getting during our test burns, uh, and that's before a fire reaches equip, uh, what we call equilibrium, uh, but it's in a much smaller stage, uh, those intensities are going to be visual, a visual indicator of whether burning can be done safely and security in case we're missing something. Um, again, ensuring adequate resources that are on site and everyone must know the plan. If, you, if we have people that don't know the plan, how do you expect us to be able to burn safely and security? Uh, we have to stay within that prescription. Burning outside the prescription uh, may achieve objectives, but it isn't necessarily a safe way to burn and we may not be able to hold on to it. We start slow, burning slowly. Uh, we're burning in and expanding guards based on current weather conditions. We'll go from tie points like a, a wet line or uh, even something as small as a, uh, a lineal disturbance like a cow trail or a larger trail or a fence line uh, or a secure point. Once the perimeters of the burns are secure, then we can commence burning the main, main unit. And we generally use ignition pattern, patterns to control those intensities. So we might just strip burn, go out, burn a long strip that's maybe only four or five or 10 meters in width along the, right along the, uh, the guard and expand that guard. Uh, and at the end of the day, we do not leave any burns in, unsecured. Uh, I created a, a, a go no decision matrix to help anybody who's, who's involved with burn. And it's very clear uh, the conditions that we can burn on. So green, it's, it's pretty secure and easy to burn in those, those, those conditions. There's higher relative humidities, uh, perhaps a little cooler temperatures and certainly low wind speeds. Uh, perfect for burning in guards. And then, then as we get guards in, if we have good guards and we have good, good resources, we can burn with 100% uh, confidence in, in, with no problems. When we get into uh, a little drier conditions, uh, slightly higher wind speeds, but into the lower humidities and, and higher temperatures, we're still going to be very, very cautious in that burning. And once we get winds over 15 kilometers per hour, uh, if we're burning uh, and it's maybe a gust and it's secure, we're fine. But if it's if it becomes a steady wind over 15 kilometers, we shut down any burning or we don't start burning. Again, in this case, we're we're assuming 100% uh, grass fuels, all cured and in level terrain. Smoke management is a big issue on any prescribed fire. Uh, how we manage smoke is a combination of wind speed, mixing height, fuel loads, and fuel conditions. Uh, drier fuels, uh, light winds will cause the, the smoke to rise up as it burns hotter and goes straight up. And then, so we get good mixing height and the smoke disperses easier. Uh, moist or green fuels produce much more smoke as do organics. Uh, ground fuels, uh, that are smoldering produce a lot of smoke and they also have uh, uh, much more finer particulates which are, are worse for human health. So we're, we're very careful about that. As I said earlier, hot, create, hot fires create a better lift for that smoke to lift, mix and dissipate. In reverse, if you get an inversion that pushes the smoke down to, and holds it close to the ground, uh, that creates higher particulates. So, uh, we watch for conditions that are going to create inversions and, and hopefully won't be burning in that uh, because we know they're coming. Here's an example of a lineal disturbance, just a cow trail. Uh, if we're burning from something like this, we'd have uh, wet in one side and wet it down on, on the uh, leeward side. And then on the windward side, we'd burn and, and widen that out a bit until we have a good guard. Uh, this is an example where we burnt from a, a trail and uh, 
when we were burning, we had winds coming from the left side of the screen towards the trail, and we just stripped burnt our way out till we had a wider secure trail. And after we get a good secure trail, you can expand the, the burning, and in this case, strip burning, where, where we're igniting one strip and then bringing another strip to, to light it, and they both pull in towards each other using, uh, in this case, light wind. So the weather conditions change or the fire starts to use oxygen and draws itself into each other. Uh, in this case here, we've got a good secure burn on the other side and we're burning from a cow trail, but we're uh, now burning with the wind and lighting with the wind and letting it go back towards the, the interior of the fire. We'll use this technique as well, just inside of a, a burn. So we use a cow path inside the prescribed burn to, to as a break to, to light from and to, to burn up areas to, to break the burn up so it's not such a large area. Uh, as you get drier intensity or conditions, you can burn at hotter intensities. In this case, this will certainly be hot enough to, to kill the surface stems of, of the woody plants, in this case, deciduous uh, aspen, uh, although the root systems are intact and uh, will probably sucker up. Grazing uh, post burn will help because the cattle will, will take those, in, those suckers and, and chew on them chew them down and increase mortality of the plant. Again, uh, hotter surface burns. A uh, lot of the, uh, the grass material here is, is going all of it's going to be consumed, but a lot of the dead and down material will be consumed as well. And, and uh, most of it will turn into white ash. Willow burns very, very hot. Uh, so we want to have good secure perimeters when we're, we're burning willow or at least if not secure conditions, then green up conditions of the fuel surrounding. Then here's a sample of, of some willow uh, just after it's been ignited and then post ignition. Again, you will, the surface uh, area of the plant has been killed, not totally consumed by fire, but, uh, and there will be some suckering, but again, cattle help to, to knock it back. In a few years from time, uh, another burn may, may set it back further. Uh, previous prescribed burns, here's a sample from the Linden Creek area in, in uh, Porcupine Hills. Post-burn production, uh, grass uh, lands average uh, 4,660 kilograms per hectare. And the deciduous plots also showed uh, 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 a decrease post uh, or uh, production of the grass certainly doubled when compared to the adjacent unburnt coulee. Uh, there was initially a 30 to 35 percent mortality in, in aspen that increased to 40, 45 percent with stress and an obvious afterwards was healthier calves, higher gait weight gains and higher uh, higher body condition scores, all positive for, for the ranching community. And uh, that's pretty much, uh, that's our, uh, the ranch area again. Uh, and just in summary, to maintain these healthy, vibrant ecosystems, we need to understand the historic disturbance patterns that created them. In this case of the grasslands, it was frequent fire as well as bison and herbivory. Uh, if we're restoring or trying to restore these, we need to, to use every possible tool and perhaps develop more. Uh, we need to develop more expertise and capacity because this is an issue that goes right across our foothills regions. And we also need to look at, at policies, whether they're uh, at a different level of, of government or within private organizations. Uh, that some of these may inadvertently become a detriment to actually meeting uh, restoration or maintenance goals. <laughs>